Welcome back to another episode of Spinning the Past. I wanted to make a video of a, another book review. It's been a, quite a while since I've done a book review. Um, this is a book that I have got through Interlibrary Loan and I'm currently um, actually typing out because um, this is pretty fragile. This is an 1878 volume called The Art of, the Art of Spinning and a thread making with calculations and tables for the use of the carding and spinning master by John Watson. This is um, printed in Glasgow again in 1878. Primarily about cotton. I was used, wanting to read this and I ordered it because I was looking on how they spun not cotton, but linen threads for the uh, in-depth study that I'm doing. But I found this really, really fascinating um, because he goes over the history. Uh, you know, the 19th century really went from um, pre-industrial to industrialized. Uh, the Industrial Revolution came through. And that affected weavers and hand spinners and thread makers and all that other stuff. All of those. So this book... Um, it's just really, really interesting. And because it was written in the um, latter part of the 19th century, we get a perspective because some of these people that he interviewed had been alive or wasn't that far in the distant past. We are, you know, another century and a half beyond that. But this, it wasn't that long ago. The 18th century was not that far in the past at this time. So, he gives a really interesting uh, background uh, about the cottons and how they used to be spun and who invented what and when and why and how. And so it's really quite um, comprehensive in that. I do wish it were more for the hand spinners, um, but he uh, his definition of the spinning masters turned out to be men. And that's something we find as well that Many of the professions that um, women used to do, which were professional hand spinners, um, once industrialization, that came out of women's hands. And then um, men who worked in the factories, they took over those positions. And the spinning master was actually someone who just made sure that there was consistency in twist in the inch. But there's all kinds of um, new jobs, new occupations that came up through, uh, through industrialization. So just a quick, here's an index, not very good. I wish it were better. That's why I'm typing it out because I'm gonna do my own word index. I'm really looking not just about cotton, but I'm looking about other the fibers such as linen, as I said. And and I, I've already gone through some of the book typing it out and I know that some of the things that I found interesting were not in the index. So, so here you go. You can buy a book if you want to set up your own cotton spinning mill back in the latter part of the 19th century. You may want to buy Mr. Watson's book because he gives you all sorts of forms and he gives you all sorts of tables in the back here. Um, a lot of it's beyond what I could understand, um, but here you go. So here we go, um, cotton and its cultivation. So. And I wish that were in the title, but that's all right. That's all right. Um, so he, he he goes on in here, um, kind of you know, the history of cotton and um, Hindustan. So you have to get over this. Some places are called differently than they are right now. But one thing I wanted to to point out here, and that's page forty one, is he talks about cottons. Now I'm trying to read this upside down and you could read it upside down but this paragraph right here when he talks about north american cottons uh, what i found interesting is the variety of cottons that were in the united states in the americas um, among the cotton of north america united states um, be the, that of georgian short and long stapled so they were both in georgia short and long stapled there was a Lu uh, there was a louisiana uh, there's a New Orleans, there was a Carolina, there was a Tennessee even, uh, group cotton. Uh, the short staple Georgia is worked up um, 
chiefly into coarser yarns of number 30. And I, if you have a question about Bradford count, uh, that is the Bradford count. That means how many hanks you could get out of one pound. So 30 is kind of coarse. Uh, for reference, uh, modern sewing thread is 60. So the more numbers, the higher the number, the finer it is. The higher the number, the finer it is. That means you needed, you could get more skeins. That means the thread had to be thinner and thinner and thinner to get more skeins out of it, of the same, out of the same weight. Um, I just found that interesting. Um, so some good things about the history here uh, on page 44 he talks about um, talks about in here about some sea island cottons um, so sea island cotton was was a thing <laughs> it was known I know it's been revived uh, uh, within my spinning lifetime which is probably the last 20 years it is a dream it is a gorgeous and and they knew that back in the 17th century, 18th, 19th, they knew what was considered good and they knew what was not very good cotton and they knew what to spin and what not to spin and from um, the different um, types of cotton. So they were, they were buying these things. They were trading around the world for the, for the cottons that they needed. Okay. Just FYI, cotton doesn't grow in England. Cotton needs soil temperatures of above, I think it's 50, 55 degrees for six months of the year. Um, that excludes where I live, so that's why I grow linen up where I live in the north. Um, but they, um, yeah, so a lot of places are starting to grow it. Um, you know, and he talks about buying it. You know, if you're a buyer, what you look at. You know? And he does talk about the history of um, how they could process this and he goes over the inventions so if you're curious about not only Eli Whitney but there were other inventions and improvements upon because you know every invention had a counter invention something somebody improved something something made it better and he kind of gives you in here as well like what you know kind of if you were going to make your own like you would need this diameter and this kind of this and this so you you know, you could see where you could, when you start mechanizing these things, how you need it. Craftsmen, uh, metallurgy people who knew what they're working with, um, and how to build machines. Um, one thing I wanted to uh, show in here, and here it is. Yeah, I thought this is kind of cool. It always puzzled me. Always puzzled me on some of the nitty noddies. And even the um, weasels, they had kind of an, what I call an odd sizing. That means the whole circumference was like 54 inches. And I'm like, why would that be? Why would 54 inches? Because it's not a yard, it's not two yards. And, and now we kind of want to you know, say it's this yardage, this, you know, we kind of like, we don't do the half yard things, but all of the, our industrialization used the weights and the measurements of the previous non-industrialized spinning. And that was, okay, we already talked about Bradford count. Okay, we already talked about that. We, we talked a little bit about Hanks, how many um, skeins you could get out of um, one pound of that fiber. And please go back to my my uh, YouTube video. Did it quite a while ago about Bradford count because the it, there's a mathematical equation, but the constants that you use it differ depending on the fiber you use. So the constant for cotton is 840. So you have the same thing, but if you're dealing with cotton, you have to plug and chug 840 into that. And we'll see why. I, I'm gonna, we're gonna see why. Why all of these things kind of come around. So if you have some antique um, nitty noddies and uh, weasels and everything, um, you might might find this interesting. So, fifty-four inches is one and a half yards. 
um, that is one round of the reel. So they're talking about the reels. Um, they're talking about the nitty nitties. They're talking about those um, reels that they use to wind off uh, after you've spun. Um, so we have 120 yards. So 80 of these one and a half, 80 of those revolutions. So exactly 80 revolutions. That's what they were looking for evenness. It was 80. And then that would be when a weasel will pop up. I have a, I'm doing some more research because I think some of the weasels, knitting on these were based on depending if it was a wool or a cotton they were doing because those coefficients differ, but I, I digress. So we have 120 yards. That equals one skein. That's what, like, everybody agreed in the industry, that is what it was. Then we have seven skeins equals 840 yards. Does that remind you of the coefficient we had for cotton? So all these things are coming together. So that is one hank. This would be one pound. So one hank we would know is one pound. So this is how they thought about things. So if I'm buying a hank, I'm not buying a skein, I'm buying a hank. That means one pound. And how many of those in cotton? I'm buying actually seven skeins. So those are seven skeins. And how many? That would be 840 yards. So if you're a weaver and you knew that you needed um, 840 yards, uh, you would say, well, I need to go and buy one hank. It's not actually one hank um but that's what they refer to and that's also also uh, the number so now this is where industrialization comes in we have 1520 yards which is 126 gains and that's 18 18 hanks and that would be one spindle so when they started having industrialization and they started creating these spindles um, that were going to be, um, they would be spinning that thread on to, it was actually equal to 18 hanks or 126 skeins or it's many yards. So all of these are, are a shortcut or a way to describe what you need, what you're buying. All those go back into that. And we still have some of that when you buy cotton yarn you're buying like a, a 20 over 2 22 2 that 2 just stands there it's a 2 ply and the 20 means it's an, a number it's it's how thick it is because all of these also apply to how thick the threads would be okay so we have yards one and a half of those reels uh one round of the reel okay so Maybe you want to try, and I'm starting to do some research uh, on antique things specifically to see if this is goes across the board of all the fibers that are out there. I'm wondering whether there were not uh, skein winders, nitty nandies that were based on a different notation. So you would have maybe instead of 80 rounds, it would click at maybe 120 or 100 or something like that. I'm doing some research on that. This is just some, I'm just kind of talking out loud here. I just found that really interesting. That just kind of coalesced everything that I've been studying in the uh, master's program. You know, when we, we had to, because every skein that we submitted, we had to do the Bradford count. We had to do those calculations. And now it makes sense because that, that was the language of, the spinning world that was the language of the weavers that was the language of industrialization um, the machines all that they they used the same they didn't invent modern now we, we have we're, um, most of the world's on metric and and there are different ways more metric more precise ways we can describe threads and all that but you'll notice that they still will use the Bradford count even though, yeah, when they have the spinning machines, yeah, we're, yeah, we're doing it really in metric now, but we're actually, it goes back to this tradition. But for the hand spinners out there, you 
you are part of a really, really important. I understand you were just so important in human history. Nick, that's just my bias, but um, nobody would have worn anything. Um, that was a textile without a spinner behind it. But there were these, at this point, not saying this was um, traditional throughout spinning history, and it didn't differ from country to country. Um, some of the other books I've re reviewed suggest that there were some um, weight differences between countries, like there was currency differences. But this is English. Uh, this is Britain. And I just find it really interesting because Bradford Count is also British. When you're doing it, that the, the yards, the skeins, the hanks, all that kind of were taken... They were, um, it was from the hand spinner time and then it uh, came into industrialization. So why did hand spinning stop? Um, also in this book, really interesting. I'm not gonna find that page right now. You can just look at that. So, uh, you know, not even, uh, well, there's just so much to know about spinning history, isn't there? One of the things that I didn't quite catch when I was studying is that the, I, know, I knew, Art, right? I knew Crompton. I knew some of these who kind of invented the spinning mules, the spinning jennies. I didn't quite get that um, they came from weaving backgrounds. So, at least in this book, it says that the weavers, um, first of all, there was a, a explosion of desire for cotton things, cotton threads. You, as a weaver, if you were commissioned to weave fabric, it was up. They would you would be given the work, but you would have to come up with the work. So it was hard and harder and harder and harder to find spinners a that could keep up, and probably keep up at a qual uh, quality. And for spinners to um, spin cotton, it wasn't. You know, there was like 18 centuries of spinning all these other things, and cotton was pretty late in your European context for spinning it. They couldn't spin it as fine as, say, in India. They couldn't spin it um, as quick, as rapidly. I'm doing some research as to really specifics, technically why that was. But the um, the weavers, you know, I don't know if you have downtime while you're waiting for spinners to spin thread or yarn, you know, you'd like, well, I really need, I really need that um, that weft so I can, so I can get my weaving done, and so I, so that that's kind of some of the impetus, and there's always right why we always have a problem, and then people try to solve that problem. Um, and if you want to learn more, the, the, there are other books, but this the first part of the book gives gives pretty good background. Now, I am here, and in this part, most of the rest of the book, they're going over calculations. It's kind of interesting to see, to hear, or read about um, all the different mechanizations that happen. Well, you know, you'd have to have... A, a carding room, and you, you'd have to have a sorting room. You'd have to willow the the cotton, and, and then yet you, you know. So all these, well, you, this exponentially, um, all the little tasks, and then uh, things like this, like um, well, to get the twist per inch. Well, and if I have, you know, there this goes around, this cog goes around so many times. This shaft. Well, how many times will that second shaft have to go around? Blah blah blah. So a lot of this is, um, are these kind of um, antiquated, and, and I did need some mathematical help on this because um, we don't write certain things this way anymore. Um, there was one that had like three, one over seven, so they, they made a decimal, but they put it in a fraction like that we don't, a form that we don't use anymore. And so this is kind of like old math, but it's new math. <laughs> Just some of the uh, what they were trying to get here. 
Uh, and then further on in the book, and then you get these giant tables. So twist table for medium spun wefts. So if you want a number 85, here's the square root. There's like calculations in here, and this is the twist per inch you would get. So most of it's there. I somewhere in here he said he talks about uh, you know I will tell you a little bit more about linen and everything later on and I haven't I haven't, I haven't finished the book but I finished enough for it to, to get through and I'm kind of another curious thing of, about the linen um, during the American Civil War the um, there was a blockade of the south uh, so that no cotton could get out so it mentions that in this book and and it was kind of the stubborn Irish who refused to adopt the cotton spinning that and they held on to their linen spinning tradition they're the ones who came out pretty well as the economy dropped out on the cotton spinning you really need to know history and economics everything if you if you love hand spinning so so He's got other books here if you want to know lessons uh, about weaving and warp making and everything. So, um, rest of the book's probably not interesting. Like I said, there's lots of tables in here. I suppose you're supposed to use the tables. Um, definitely by the 18, um, definitely by 1878, um, um, it was all machine spun by that time and they developed techniques that they could um, they could get the finer counts for the you know remember at the same time we have other inventions such as the sewing machine and the sewing machine required first of all a, a very thin thread and it had to have a sufficient twist and you know it had you know be able to withstand abrasion and so you know, that also, so all these things were happening at the exact same time. So that's why I find it really interesting. Again, this is called The um, the Art of Spinning and Thread Making. Again, thread making for them is exclusively cotton by this time, whereas in previous centuries, linen was the primary thread. So I hope you've um, gotten something out of it i'm trying out this new webcam to do some overhead shots so you can um, you could see the book with me i don't know you just give me some feedback whether that works or not for you and i really hope that all of you are enjoying um, the season i just think this is a great time to spend it's a great time to, to catch up with my spinning reading just always interesting and and just the more you read the more you learn the more kind of tangents you go on but I do need to get back to some of my own uh, hand spinning if you will but so many things in here um, look for old books that talk about spinning you will learn so much why things are now the way they are why certain wheels are used for certain types of fibers and I did have one woman who got very angry with me on Facebook who thought I was inventing this whole thing about skeins and hangs and like I just invented it I was lying basically to the group and uh, she got very mad at me this stuff was real we don't have our current spinning without previous century spinnings and they created wheels wheels were tools that's all they were. They were tools to do something. So they invented the flax wheel was the best kind of spinning mechanism for flax. And the, and the wool wheels were better for spinning wools. There was a specific purpose for those, um, all the tools, all the equipment. There was a reason. Back in the day, it wasn't spinning for fun and hobby. It was spinning for need. And people didn't want all day to spin. To, they needed to get things done as efficiently as possible. There was always that, even in those times, even a couple centuries ago. People knew, people built things, they improved things, they tinkered with things, tinker, 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 tinker. And that's kind of how we're, where we are right now. Anyways, I, I think that's it for today, and I will catch you next time on Spinning the Past.